So as um, presented, I'm going to be talking about the Catholic Cabal of Francisco Manuel de Mello. Now essentially this talk is about one particular book, which is this kind of um, strange artifact in Portuguese literature. It's a book about Kabbalah, but it really doesn't come from any form of particular Portuguese Kabbalistic tradition, and neither the, the, the ideas that it presents, the conceptualization that it offers, have any sort of continuity. And even analyzing the written record of its author, Francisco Manuel de Mello, who was one of the most prolific 17th century Baroque authors of Portugal, this book doesn't re seem to relate in any way with any of the other things he has ever written. So it's just this strange artifact that people often don't know how to interpret, they don't understand why it even exists. And the, often the scholars who study Francisco Manuel de Mello, they completely lack any kind of appreciation for this book. A few criticisms have been made of it, uh, authors who try to approach this book and try to interpret it, but I don't believe actually that justice has ever been done to, to the Tratado. So my idea with this talk is to just explore the Tratado a little bit and try to really analyze what this book brings forth in terms of Kabbalistic conceptualizations in Portugal, which I believe has never actually been done. So, to start off, just a little bit about the author, Francisco Manuel Mel. As I mentioned, this was a 19, um, 17, uh, he was a 17th century man, born in 1608 uh, and died in 1666. Uh, very much an intellectual of his time, completely integrated into Portuguese high society Baroque thinking, with all its good aspects and terrible aspects, as we shall see. Uh, one of the most prolific authors and uh, a relevant diplomat in his time. He actually had a military career, as was his family tradition, with a focus on mathematics. He was involved in the Portuguese Restoration, which is a moment in 1640, when uh, 80 years before that, the Portuguese crown was with the Castilian king. In 1640, there's a revolution and Portugal once again <coughs> regains independence. And as a diplomat, he was traveling throughout Europe to find support and recognition to the newly independent Portugal. Then he is imprisoned between 1644 and 55. And this is a really odd story that historians haven't been able to figure out. Apparently, him and the king were in love with the wife of a count. Somebody got stabbed. <coughs> Um, nobody knows what happened. He took the fall for it. He got imprisoned. Um, during his imprisonment, however, it's when he actually produces uh, the greatest amount of literature. Um, books on poetry, theater, history, and morality. Uh, as part of his imprisonment, he actually ends up being exiled to Brazil for three years. Um, eventually, he returns and he joins the Academia culture, which were these um, semi-independent intellectual groups of uh, individuals who would get together to discuss issues of history and religion and science and the, their whole point was to bring new enlightenment ideas into Portugal. So he was part of that whole, um, uh, that whole scheme. And he's also reinstated as a diplomat. Now, to look at the Tratado, I do believe that the Tratado um, contains in itself or is itself um, a, a certain tension and a cultural dialogue. This is a book written by a 17th century Portuguese intellectual man, very specifically a Catholic man. And there is um, a problem here for, because Francisco Manuel Melo recognizes the divine authority of Kabbalah as a divine teaching. It's a, of course, it's a Jewish topic. Uh, Jewish mysticism, and as a Catholic man, he is forced to admit the authority of Jewish sources, but as a 17th century Portuguese man, he is tremendously anti-Semitic. So he cannot accept the legitimacy of the Jewish people. And this is what the Tratado actually struggles with. It's a book that, while recognizing Jewish authority and Jewish thinking, 
cannot accept Jews as valid theologians. But to continue to the certain historical context needs to be provided. I'm going to talk very briefly on Kabbalah, and I do mean briefly. Do not take my word on anything. This is just so we don't get lost in what I'm about to explain. So Kabbalah is essentially um, a medieval Jewish tradition. It comes up in the 12th and 13th century in southern France and Provence. Eventually kind of migrates to Aragon and Castile and creates that, which some people have called Hispanic Kabbalah. The shining example of which will be the Zohar, which is the Book of Splendor, which pretty much sets the standard, the gold standard for uh, a form of intellectual, highly intellectual and theologian-based Kabbalah and whose ultimate purpose is to extract from the Torah esoteric and mystical significances, which are not immediately obvious to its reading. Now, this, these ideas presented by rabbis have, throughout history, been occasionally recognized by Christian intellectuals. And many have looked at Kabbalah and observed that, well, the um, conclusions and the new ideas that Jews are able to extract from the Torah using these techniques, uh, if we apply them equally to Christian texts, we are able to look deeper than the, the original text and extract also our own esoteric knowledge based on Christianity. Um, and this, this apprehension of Kabbalah by Christian intellectual has created what has been called Christian Kabbalah. Particularly among these, Raymond Lowell in the 13th and 14th century was one of the first to really appreciate Jewish thinking and its possible applications to Christian texts in order to acquire a further insight into Christianity. But in the Renaissance you have names such as Pico de Mirandola or Johann Reuschlein. Um, and these were men who were very much part of the, in, uh, uh, the Renaissance. And not only were they looking at Kabbalah, they were equally looking at newly available translated sources, such as the Corpus Hermeticum, or newly available um, Neoplatonic literature, and they were trying to actively reconceptualize a new idea of religion, a new idea of the cosmos, a new understanding of the world, by taking elements from all of these previously inaccessible sources. Now, it is precisely at this point, at Christian Kabbalah, that the Tratado places itself at. It's explicitly a Christian book on Kabbalah. However, it attempts to conceptualize a new form of Kabbalah. In its own narrative, uh, Francisco Manuel Mel describes that, that the Kabbalah arises from the absence of true prophecies due to the sins of the Jewish people. So let's say, 5,000 years ago, the Jewish people, as the chosen people of God, had a direct access to God through their prophets. However, due to their errors, however, whichever they were, they lost this capacity. But still, God or the angels gave them the Kabbalah so that through its use they could look into the Torah and, for, and continuously extract new religious ideas uh, and establish a kind of uh, two-step communication with the divine, as the Torah is identifiable with God itself at times. Now, however, envious rabbis, persistent in their errors, hid this knowledge and corrupted it. Pico de Mirano and Reuschlein and others rescued it, but with great defects. So what he is claiming here is that the creation of Christian Kabbalah wasn't actually a creation of something new. Men such as Mirano and Reuschlein actually purified Kabbalah of some of the Jewish errors, meaning that in Francisco Manuel Melo's perspective, the Kabbalah has always been intrinsically Christian, but the Jews have kind of hid this. And the Tratado then, in this treatise, we shall go beyond those who merely gave us the premise of the science. And when he mentions those who merely gave us the premise of the science, he's mentioning specifically Miranda and Reuschlein. So in his idea, even though they were right in recognizing Kabbalah as Christian, they didn't go far, far enough. And there are still plenty of errors, plenty of Jewish iniquities within Kabbalah that need to be purified in order for Kabbalah to once again go back to its original state. He thus defines two forms of Kabbalah. The just Kabbalah, which is a deep meditation on hidden mysteries that used for names, letters, numbers, and figures of the holy books, and an unjust Kabbalah, a judicial fiction which prognosticates the future with uncertainty using vain observations, mixing the sacred with the profane. 
So in essence, what he aims to do is to create a Catholic Kabbalah. Now in his own thinking, this is actually kind of understandable. Catholicism for him is, of course, the one true religion. And the God that it worships is a universal God, which is, in, in essence, a Catholic God. The God that gave Kabbalah to the Jews is still this same God. Logically, the Kabbalah, as originally given to the Jews, obviously needs to be Catholic, because God is Catholic. Even though Christianity hadn't come up or the Catholic Church had not been organized, this is irrelevant. If we are worshipping God in the most correct possible way as Catholic, then all the religious significance and all the religious demands of God need to be universal. So the point is, he is going to now look at Kabbalah and anything which he detects, which in any way goes against Catholic dogma, Catholic morals, uh, Catholic laws, or just common sense, he will immediately remove this and say this is clearly a later edition because this, isn't, this doesn't agree with Catholicism. And how he will do this? Mostly is by following a particular source. A book by a man called Waldemar. It's a book against uh, incantations and psalms, which is a Portuguese uh, specific definition for just verbal magic. In, in rural areas, you call it ensalmos. Um, and this is a book very much in the tradition of Martin Del Rio, um, Inquiries into Magic, which is a very famous European book. Um, and Valdemora's main thesis is that words, in essence, uh, have no inherent power. Words are circumstantial. Words are associated with language, languages aren't universal, so all words are circumstantial. And they cannot have any effective power to manipulate the world, they don't have religious or magical or uh, divine significance. If you believe so, then you are, this is effectively superstition. And as superstition, it is not admissible within Catholicism. So, having this as his guide, Francisco Manuel Mello then starts to divide Kabbalah into several sections. He first divides this into what he calls Presites and Merkana, which to him are physics and metaphysics, respectively. Bresit, which is likely corruption of Bereshit, which means creation, it's the first word in Genesis. He defines as a mystical interpretation of scripture, including theology and elevation of the mind towards the divine, as well as the senses, judgment and reason. And in here he also includes the study of natural magic. And natural magic, what he describes is the study of occult virtues. And occult virtues is this concept you have in the 17th century and before and also after. And these are ultimately natural properties of animals, minerals, and plants, which are unknowable to the intellect, and which were placed on earth for the benefit of man by God. So he includes a study of these elements within Bresis. Merkana, which is likely a corruption of Merkaba, which means throne or chariot, and this usually refers to pre-Kabbalistic Jewish mysticism, um, Herkala and, and Merkaba, Herkalot and Merkaba, which are forms of mysticism inspired by the vision of Ezekiel. He defines this as an Orphic and symbolic theology, which includes prognostication, um, exploration of the names of God, and the names of God that he specifies are related to the Ten Sephirot, which we'll explain briefly in a minute, and also the names of angels. Now, obviously, this is a dangerous practice because prognostication and divination are forbidden by Catholicism. So, not all elements within Merkana are admissible. He then divides this into the Sephirot and Simod. The Sephirot, likely corruption of Sephirot, which translates as numbers. And this is often um, related to the Kabbalistic or Sephirotic tree of life. And this is um, a diagram of sorts. And not all diagrams of the Sephirot are equal, and there are several arrangements of this, but this is just a popular one. And this basically, the ten Sephirot are ten aspects, or ten emanations of God. And the way that they are displayed translates certain relations between them, and basically it's um, this multi-layered map of both God, um, the world, man, uh, divine itself. It's a, it's a multi-layered cosmological map. However, he doesn't go into detail at all. He just mentions, this exists, this is unlawful. So that's out. Then he goes into the Semod, 
which I actually don't know where he's deriving that name from. Which he calls speculative Kabbalah. This he divides into arithmetics and Tamansi Temura. Tamansi Temura is, this is likely a corruption of Temura, which he wasn't that far off. And he defines this as this, the, the technique to determine the good and ill of man, which to him amounts to prognostication. Prognostication is unlawful. There. Then he's left with arithmetic, arithmetic which he divides, oh no, sorry. Uh, as, as he defines it, as the interpretation of the secrets of names, letters, numbers, and figures, and this only to the extent of the humanly possible, so as a pure intellectual exercise. No divine inspiration is allowed to step into this, ex into this practice. He divides this into computational Kabbalah and resolutory Kabbalah. Resolutory, he claims, is the analysis of individual letters and words, a dangerous practice due to the potential person personal projection on scripture. And it's the analysis and interpretation of words within scripture to try to extract new meaning from. Compusational, he gives three elements that are inside this. Changing letters in the word to make up other words. Change the order of the alphabet. Meditation on the four letter name of God and the 72 names of God. This last aspect, what he seems to be referring to is something which is usually called gematria, which is this idea that um, Every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has a number associated with it. If you grab a word and you add up the numbers of all the letters that make up this word, you get a, a, different, word, a different number. And with this number, you can make relationships with other words and other significances, just create a map of hidden meanings behind every single word and every single letter. Uh, what he says is that gematria at large is unlawful because this type of creation of relationships between things may amount to divination. So you can't do this. You can only use the Mataya to meditate on the name of God. You can only use this technique to dwell into the divine and try to gain a better understanding of the divine, the relationship this has. You cannot step outside of this particular area of inquiry. And another weird thing, that these two things, that he mentions first. In other Kabbalistic systems, this is what is usually referred to as temura. It's the switching of, of letters within a word mm -hmm. and the changing of the alphabet in order to create uh, combinations of letters. So it's really weird to try to understand what exactly are his sources and what, how is he interpreting them. He seems to be mixing and matching significances and definitions and it's kind of hard to actually make up what he's talking about on clear terms. Now, after all of this, after having exposed what is proper Kabbalah, the big part of the text, and probably the largest part of the text, is Francisco Manuel Mel trying to validate that words, letters, and numbers do have intrinsic power. Now, this is strange, because this is a direct antithesis of his main source, Valdemora. However, the power that he seems to go to great lengths to attribute to words is not an inherent divine power, it's a, a, a personal human power. In contemporary terms, the type of discourse that he engages with might be described as psychology. He is attempting to prove that certain words in certain, circum in certain circumstances within certain individuals of certain cultures do have some kind of intrinsic power that transcends the word itself, but this power is entirely um, personal and human. This is a type of discourse which is common in his time period and it, something that is propagated through time, it, it really blossoms in the 19th century and contemporarily it still happens, which is a naturalization discourse. It's, it's usually proponents of magic or mysticism throughout time tend to attempt to validate their own practice and justify their own practice by referring to the most cutting-edge scientific knowledge available to them. They don't try to describe magic as being a divine virtue, they try to describe magic as a psychological process or a natural process. And this is what he is attempting to do here with Kabbalah in order to save it from Voldemort's sword. And this is quite unique on, on the Portuguese scale. Now, to finish off the book, 
he goes on to describe the 32 Kabbalistic intelligences. And this is basically a chapter which is a summary of a book called Sefer Yetzira, which is a pre-Kabbalistic text. Um, and with the, and the, the 32 Kabbalistic intelligences, you can interpret them as the 10 Sephirot and the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet together, it makes 32. And what he seems to be suggesting is that every single aspect that he has mentioned about what constitutes Kabbalah can be worked with in 32 different ways. So he's actually proposing that this is actually a pretty big subject and uh, a man can get lost in it and he, it's not, even though he did cut out, cut, cut out a lot of things, it's not really as restricted as it might seem. And, but he also says that um, he also fully rejects any astrological interpretations of the Sefer Yetzirah as the, the, the influence of corrupt rabbis because the Sefer Yetzirah has explicit astrological interpretations, but he denies this completely. This isn't Catholic, so obviously that, that can't be real. So, given all of these things, there are two positions which one might take towards the Tratat. The first is, well, looking at Manuel Melo's discourse, he clearly does not have a good grasp on several items of Kabbalah, he doesn't seem to be particularly knowledgeable about them. He makes mistakes in definitions, in attributions, and this is actually the position that most scholars who have looked at the Tratado have taken. That Valdemora is just, or the Tratado is a, an, an impressive book, um, an ambitious, it doesn't propose anything new to the Kabbalistic discourse, and it's largely a forgettable piece of writing. Th that's a position you can take, I suppose. But the other position you can assume is that if you place yourself within the um, position of, of Mel himself, if you assume, if you take the Tratado at its face value, and you go with the um, if you go with the, um, if you don't take a, a position upon it, which is a third party's position, but if you read it on its own terms, the Tratado is creating something new. Even though Francisco Manuel de Mello won't accept it's something new, he's believing that he is renewing it. But it is creating something new. In this perspective, whether or not Mello uses the correct words to describe the correct things, defines things correctly according to some third party's opinion of what that thing is supposed to be, is actually irrelevant. He, has, he is effectively creating a new Kabbalah. And the relationship that this Kabbalah has with any other, uh, any other person's Kabbalah, be them Jewish or Christian, is irrelevant on its own terms. As such, this, is, this ends up being quite an ambitious book. Um, um, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know, it's um, a, an absolute novelty in terms of the vast dialogue, of international dialogue of Kabbalah on the European scale. It not only assumes itself as a Christian Kabbalistic text, but takes one step beyond that, and it is something which, even though its influence is reduced or non-existent, uh, it's something that really should be appreciated as a truly ambitious piece of writing that attempts to reconceptualize something which is a broad international and European debate. Thank you.